From Sattva Knowledge Institute, this is Decoding Impact, the podcast where we apply systems thinking in conversation with extraordinary experts to understand what it truly takes to scale solutions in the social sector. Decoding Impact is hosted by Ratish Balakrishnan, a co-founder and managing partner at Sattva. Welcome to today's episode. India has a significantly low female labor force participation rate with over 80% of the women out of the workforce. Out of the 19% who are in the workforce, a majority of them are employed in the informal sector and lack decent working conditions and access to minimum wages. The lack of adequate sex disaggregated data and evidence qualifying these challenges inhibit our efforts towards women economic empowerment. The large official data sets in India are mostly based at the household level, rendering it impossible to glean gender-specific gaps. In this podcast, we want to explore the gaps in the current gender data and ways of integrating and improving the same. We have with us Mitali Nikor, who is an economist and a gender policy specialist. She is the founder of a youth-led research group, Nikor Associates. She advises multilateral organizations such as ADB, UN Women and the World Bank, as well as private sector consulting firms such as EY and PwC. She is also an advisor to the steering committee of BRICS CCI Young Leaders. Mitali holds a Master's in Economics from the London School of Economics and a Bachelor's in Economics from the University of Delhi. Mitali, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have this conversation, Ritesh. Excellent. Mithali, before we talk about the issue of data and gender and women economic empowerment, I'd love to know your journey, uh, Mithali, and also what got you where you are and you know your specific focus on the subject. My first job was, in fact, with UN Women in New York. Following that, I joined the World Bank for some time, and then I moved to a consulting firm in Africa, worked there for a few years, and then, you know, the homeland came calling and I came back here, joined PwC and then following that ADB and then World Bank and finally went independent in uh, 2019. Um, and, And at that point is where I really started looking at the issue of women's labor force participation Actually, I was prompted to do that by uh, one of, uh, you know, one of the great sort of leaders of the feminist movement in India. She was 85 at that time, uh, Kamla Nath. And she said, you know, I want to write a book on 50 years of gender equality in India. And I said, do you really want to say gender equality or gender inequality? And she said, you know, that's interesting. And let's let's explore the topic together. And I was tasked to write the section and and the book chapter on female labor force participation and women's economic empowerment. And I ended up building a data bank using, you know, women's labor force participation and other labor market indicators, uh, you know, data on that from various sources. And, you know, you have to sort of widen your search when you're doing this because you may open an ILO database and the numbers would turn out to be completely different from what government of India is saying or what UNESCO is saying. So, or what World Bank is saying. <laughs> so, you know, we we ended up building a comparative database and finally using, of course, government of India statistics for the analysis because it was actually the most complete database. And, uh, you know, we traced the journey of women's labor force participation From 1955-56, which is when the first NSO survey was done uh, to to map labor market and employment data to 2020-21, actually. And that's how, you know, our research and area uh, of interest developed and and my team developed and Nikor Associates was born with that particular book chapter. And since then, we really haven't looked back. We continue to advocate and research the issue. And we have our data banks, we have our secondary literature, we're also doing a lot of primary work now, uh, talking to a lot of women's organizations to always keep an ear to the ground. 
so that's really been the journey so far and uh, definitely i think i have a very very long way to go when i see stalwarts in this field um and and what more we can do but my interest more than just research is to to experiment with policy solutions because a lot of our clients are coming to us and saying okay we know the problems but please tell us how do we solve them so i think that's where uh, you know my mindset and focus is at at present Thank you so much uh, Mitali and it's been an interesting journey for you and I just want to jump right into the point you made uh, when the chapter started and you know you talked about the ILO data and the government of India data for anyone who's going to do this again what is the lay of the land of data for women economic empowerment today like what are the various sources we have what sort of insights are we finding and if you could also add what are the gaps that we are already seeing So I think at a central level at a national level we have done fairly well as a country so far on on data collection over a long term. Now of course there is a huge scope of improvement right and and so I'm going to address your question in two parts firstly what do we have available when it comes to uh, women empowerment the most important source of course is the nso's periodic labor force participation survey and the periodic labor force survey which gives us access to most of the labor market indicators now on an annual basis as well as on a quarterly basis so this is the first and most important source because this is a national source again as you mentioned the household level but also covers um you know organized and unorganized uh sectors it's not only looking at urban areas but also looking at rural areas and it's looking at uh you know the entire collection of uh, and, and collection of people who are working in regular salary jobs casual jobs who are working in their own enterprises who are in self employment and even within that they are providing us a distinction between unpaid helpers in household enterprises which is a very important category when it comes to women's employment and own account workers that is small enterprises which don't actually hire uh, workers you know it's just one person or maximum two piece uh, two persons working together which is what a majority of indian enterprises look like so that's the most important uh, set the second is the national family and house uh, you know health survey nfhs and the national family and health survey which is not done annually it's done every 4 or 5 years we just had a new set of uh, data that's come in from there nfhs 5 for 2019 to 21 and we have several rounds before that around 4 rounds before that so we have five, five rounds of data over there which give us good indications of women empowerment in the sense of ownership of mobile phones access to the internet uh, women's health indicators women's education indicators literacy then whether women are working for cash which is like a you know proxy question on employment and also women's agency you know how many decisions are women taking independently or do they need their husband's permission for that and also mobility because there's a clear question in the nfhs which asks whether women are allowed to visit markets or leave their village or go to a nearby health facility alone without permission which is a very important question to ask because it really you know gives a sense of women's ability to take these independent decisions on their movements you know so the nfhs is i would say the second most important source in terms of high frequency data and especially during covid the center for monitoring indian economy's labor uh, market data has been a very important source because it's given high frequency monthly data on on the you know changes in the labor market but definitely i would say that you know the the representativeness of that is not as wide as um you know the nf um the the plfs data and the nso data which is the first source that i talked about um but it's still been a very valuable way of tracking the movement you know on a on a more frequent basis so there are these three principal sources for me and apart from that you know at nicor associates we've also built something called the states of gender equality database where we've actually mapped 
a lot of the indicators of women empowerment at state level. So we've actually taken the economic surveys of various states, uh, you know, the latest available data, but there's a, you know, of course, time series available there as well. And we've taken Niti Aayog's SDG index and, and uh, you know, SDG 5 index mapping in order to build that. And we've taken at least 10 to 12 data source, uh, you know, data indicators from NFHS, NSO, and then state level data to build a you know mapping of how different states are doing on gender equality outcomes and uh, for us you know even the state level data has been an important source and the state economic surveys the state economic assessment reports which give um, you know data on women's uh, empowerment outcomes at state level have also been very important I want to touch upon a few things, uh, you know, uh, as you were talking that struck me and I want to just reiterate a question I had as well. Uh, the first point that you made around the systems that we have built for data collection in India, uh, you know, is, is very robust and sometimes, you know, uh, we, just, uh, we take it for granted because we've always had these systems. And I often remember how uh, this started around the time we got our independence and this is not a very recent phenomenon. And uh, and I often wonder how a lot of the founding fathers of independent India have been able to look ahead and say, we are going to take up challenges and we're going to have an ambition for our country that's far greater than the capacity of the state they had at that moment. For a country like India, fresh out of a you know freedom struggle to say, we're going to have a national level data set on all of these things. And to continue that over so many decades, I think is fascinating. And I think we are very fortunate to have had uh, leaders who've had that foresight uh, in the beginning. I think that's number one. I think the second thing that you talked about issues like mobility, you know, where do we know whether women can go and do this? And, uh, and sometimes it's easy in an urban environment to underestimate the necessity or the value of such data. Uh, I, I was in rural Rajasthan a few weeks ago and I, uh, you know, we were looking at the problem of girls applying for open school examinations because a very, very small number of girls who are out of school actually apply for open school exams. And if you ask them why, just the need to get out of their homes and go to a place two kilometers away to register for that exam on their own is impossible. And in the absence of a supportive adult or a peer who's a male, oftentimes uh, girls choose not to write the exam because they don't want to do that two kilometer trek, you know. And for me, it was such a strong and stark reminder on the role of norms, uh, you know, in attainment of education and employment opportunities that are that we make available uh, for people today. So I just wanted to reiterate the point that you made around um, why indicators like that are extremely critical for us to understand some of the softer factors and not structural factors behind why women, women economic empowerment is where it is today. What are still the gaps? What do you think is still missing that we need to address as part of the data? So I think that we need to build a lot of capacity at state level to get more and more accurate data. I think at the national level, what happens is that a lot of the you know, national agencies, et cetera, rely on national surveys. And then the data often differs from what is being collected at the state level, because at the state level, you know, they often do the data collection in their own languages. And therefore, they end up getting more accurate answers. So in many cases, you know, when you especially have empowerment indicators and indicators which require discussion with women, that data collection, the mode of data collection also matters quite a lot. And, you know, it cannot just be national enumerators going every year and doing that data collection. I think we need to have a more robust system where we collect the data at the state level, and then that feeds into a national framework. You know, so I think over time, that should be the aim, that the data collection happens in a much more decentralized fashion. And, and also, you know, in terms of indicators and, and in terms of, you know, what is important to different states and even different districts really needs to reflect in, in the overall list. So say, for example, when we are trying to measure women's digital inclusion, right? At this point, we basically have two questions. Do you have access to the internet? And do you own a mobile phone, right? This is all we are actually asking in any kind of uh, National Family and Health Survey database or, you know, that's pretty much the best source we have. But there are so many levels of digital inclusion, right? There's The first level is, 
do you use your phone? I mean, one is that you own a phone, it's registered in your name, but how, do you use it? Then how much time do you spend using it every day? What are the different aspects for which you use it? Do you use it for just WhatsApp or do you use it to make calls and video calls? And then do you use it for your business or for your work? And also, so the first level is ownership. The second level is use. And then how is that use really governed by gender norms and social norms? Because, you know, are you conscious when you are using your phone or are you, you know, free when you're using it and you can use it outside the home, inside the home? Who do you typically talk to? You know, all of these patterns. And then finally, the optimization that that phone, that one device, does it actually help you in increasing the sales of your business? You know, so there are so many, I'm just giving one example, but this way we can design so many questions to be part of national surveys and to give us insights into things which can actually hinder women's labor force participation today as well as going forward. Because I do feel the digital divide is one of the most understudied issues, um, you know, that we have in, in this century and, and it's going to be over the next 10 to 20 years, the main deterrent for female labor force participation because the new jobs are going to go to digital natives and if more and more women are uh, you know excluded from digital uh, devices ownership as well as use and optimal use that too then they would not be able to de deploy it for their work so you know why why are we not asking more questions around the uh, digital divide for example is is one area same way, you know, when we talk about labor force and what kind of work women do, I mean, if you look at this uh, really rich data set has come from the NSO's time use surveys and, uh, you know, the kind of amazing insights that are coming from it, that how many hours in a day are women spending on cooking, cleaning, childcare, elderly care, you know, we need to be asking many, many more such questions uh, on a regular basis. This is the first time that time use survey has come in 2019. And then we don't know when the next one will be held. But that also needs to be a regular um, feature, you know, if it at least every five years, if not every year. So we can do a lot more on unpaid work as well when it comes to data collection. Thinking about the digital usage, uh, you know, and the two very contrasting insights uh, when you go on the ground. One, on the one hand, you recognize how it's a very rationed usage of mobile phones for women in a family. You know, who gets access to it? What time of the day do you get access to it? What can you do with it? Uh, how much data do you get in this? You know, I mean, so you probably will do, uh, women use it for a lot of the low data required stuff. Well, you know, there is uh, usage uh, on the other hand for high data stuff that is by the men in the house, for example. So there is a lot of that. Um, restrictions that we can't even imagine, which, as you rightly said, data should capture. On the other hand, for me, it was also interesting. Uh, it also creates broad notions and stereotypes in our minds around who do we, who we find where. For example, I think there's a general notion that rural women don't have access to phones. Uh, and that it's not something that they, you know, can have unfettered access to. And recently, uh, you know, our team and I, we were uh, in, in a rural area and we met with a set of girls who are out of school. One of them had like 500 Instagram followers and has a, she's actually an influencer. She's rural, yeah, and she doesn't speak English, but she had all the works of how she plans her reels, does her reels, frequencies, etc. And sometimes it also then, you know, um, uh, helps us think beyond the stereotypes that we are working with as well to say, hey, what does this new India look like? And how do we dispel notions around how we understand access to digital as well? And as you rightly said, the information around digital is as important as literacy today, you know, because your comfort with digital unlocks opportunities in education, at work, social service delivery, all of which hinges on an assumption on how much does this person have access to digital? And there is uh, a policy level blindness in some sense on the level of access to digital as well, which we've been working on and so on. So I think just wanted to reiterate that the point you're making around digital being foundational, I think is extremely critical. You've been looking at this data for the last few years, Mithali, and uh, if I had to ask you, let's say the top three to five things that have stood out for you 
in the data around women um, you know labor force participation because uh, you know you and i would agree that there is a lot of interest in this topic but there's very limited nuanced understanding among people uh, around why this is the case today why are only 19% of the women working uh, you know uh, what is the challenge today what is the profile of a woman in a rural india or an urban india today so i'd love to sort of hear any top 3 to 5 insights that have stood with you um, as you're looking at this data over the last few years brilliant brilliant i this is my favorite topic so uh, so i think it's very interesting and i think the first thing that i've come to realize of course the first one is around the time series mapping that we've done you know so we started looking at how the trend line looks you know from 1955 to 2020 21 and what stood out for us was the year 2017 18 So the year 2017-18 was when female labor force participation was at its absolutely lowest point overall in the country when we you know look at from independence to now so 2017-18 was when we hit our nadir and then from 2017-18 to 2021 there have been slow rises that are sort of you know uh, being seen in the female labor force participation including in the covid year so what was happening here is that in the in the few decades leading up to 1718 india was showing consistent increases in per capita income so there was an income effect right and women who are being considered as secondary income earners especially in the rural areas were were the ones who were exiting the labor force actually if you break it down into rural and urban the urban labor force participation was pretty stagnant it reduced a few percentage points by 1718 but not as much as rural rural nearly halved so clearly there was an income effect at play that you know if your household income is increasing then the woman doesn't need to work so there was that aspect then there was the aspect of unpaid work right the fact that you have this pressure of unpaid work at home creates a opportunity cost and a barrier so there's of course the social norm right that the woman has to if she is working outside the home she has to do the housework and she has to do the work outside the home so many women find that hard to balance and they just said you know what we don't want to balance we'll just give up and that's okay because systems were not created there were no institutional um support mechanisms for women to you know go to office and say there has to be a crash and that's something that came up in again 1718 when the maternity act came in and it said that women need to have a longer maternity leave and they need to have crashes um you know in the office and that was actually mandated so there was a clear recognition in the last 3 to 4 years that you know you need to have more institutional support mechanisms which didn't exist before and that particularly deterred urban women from coming back into the workforce now the other aspect is really also around occupational segregation which clearly stands out so what you see is in the data you have a concentration of women at two extremes you have the illiterate or you know the ones who have just done primary education which are highly you know in the high representation in the labor force and the workforce and the second group which has a high representation in the labor force and the workforce is post graduate women so essentially your profile of women who are working today fit two typical you know roles or or representations one is women with low levels of education who are in rural areas doing agricultural work typically agriculture wage labor and the second is you know urban highly educated highly skilled women who are working in the services sector be it in education healthcare financial services or any other you know corporate services sectors these are the two biggest groups of working women today where are the women absent clearly in the manufacturing sector you know the the only representation of women in the manufacturing sector is actually women who are entrepreneurs typically running self help groups and they also are concentrated on two or three sub sectors like textiles food processing and some services in the beauty and salon space so if you look at the data it's very clear that there's a concentration of women 
you know, in specific sectors. And this occupational segregation has actually reduced the growth of female labor because there are only few sectors where women are getting opportunities and getting employment. They are also lacking networks to break into newer and newer sectors, especially STEM sectors. You know, so the World Economic Forum report, the Global Gender Gap report also notes that women have a very low representation in STEM sectors when in India. So this is, you know, these are a few of the trends which are looking very, very clear at the moment that number one, we hit our nadir in 1718. There's been some amount of improvement since then. And that improvement is primarily on account of improving uh, you know, labor force participation in the urban areas only in the last one year, 1920 to 2021, have we seen rural women coming back to work. And that's primarily because of the economic distress. So you see that those rural women are coming back to work because they are seeing their household incomes falling. Again, a you know, representation of the income effect. So number one, we've seen that trend. Number two, we've seen that you know, primarily urban women, rural women, all women are deterred from working because of this secondary income status, because of the income effect, because of unpaid work burdens, social norms, and the appropriateness of the job role. That, you know, the work that I should be doing should be fit and good for a woman. And that has really, you know, created barriers and therefore created occupational segregation relegating women to low growth, low productivity sectors. So these, I would say, are the top three to five trends that we are seeing in our analysis today. Thank you, Tali. One of the points that you made, I wanted to sort of double click on is this income effect, you know, and this has been discussed without the data that you have that perhaps that was the reason. Um, two, two questions that I had, I, I'm, I'm interested in knowing how 2017, 18 might have, the, might have been this pivotal year, because to be the year where we have the lowest labor workforce participation of women since independence is saying something, you know, so I wonder whether you are, um, you know, is there something around 2017, 18 that you think, uh, you know, is the reason for it? Uh, would love to know because that sort of seems like a very unique role and a time uh, for us to have chosen this. And secondly, uh, and I don't know if you, uh, you, you've done this as part of your research, is this income effect something that we see globally, you know, in other countries as well? Uh, where country uh, countries where women labor force participation is um, you know lower than us or higher than us, I wonder if there is a a trend or a pattern on how this income effect plays out, because given just our size, our uh, labor workforce participation numbers for women seem very very low. So I wonder if there are global precedents to this income effect that you're seeing in our data as well. I think that's a very interesting question that, you know, why this particular year? I think, you know, Ratish, what happens is I'm sure that this impact and this effect had been happening for a few years. And then when the, you know, periodic labor force participation survey uh, started, the PLFS, the first year was 1718. And they revised the methodology a little bit, um, you know, and they made the methodology and questionnaire a bit wider. They started you know, expanded the sample size compared to 11-12 when the previous, uh, you know, survey had happened by the National Statistical Organization. So I think there is some amount of a measurement, uh, you know, clarity that came in in 17-18. But the second aspect is also that, you know, these things are often part of a longer trend and then you find them in a particular year. So I think that's that's really one of the, you know, reasons why we see that it's, you know, hitting that point in, in 1780. And because we have measured the data annually thereafter, we are able to track, um, you know, the, the trajectory of these indicators much more routinely. Whereas before 1718, what was happening was that the surveys would happen every five years or every seven years or every eight years, depending on the capacity and budget of, um, you know, the Ministry of Statistical Programming and Implementation. So I think in 1718, the methodology was also revised a little bit. There was a, a you know, greater focus on collecting the labor market data much more uh, in depth. And I think that is what yielded finally um, the, the clarity on, on what was going on. And the annual monitoring is is giving even more clarity to see you know where that trend is is going 
because before that we only had the 11 12 survey that uh, you know that we could look at and in fact a lot of papers that are written on female labor force participation and falling labor female labor force participation actually stop at 2011 12 at which point they say oh 11 12 is the year in which it was the lowest but then you know 17 18 came and um, that was even lower so the mm. first that's the first reason you know the, the statistical observation of it that yes we found it in this year but obviously the underlying trend was going on so the underlying trend of the income effect and especially in rural areas of women kind of moving out of the workforce is the more interesting underlying trend for me and as i was saying you know there are two or three factors over there the first one is really the occupational segregation when we look at the data for men actually again over the long term we find that by 2004 5 men are migrating away from agriculture towards manufacturing and services even in rural areas and there's a clear migration also from rural to urban areas but even when they are staying within rural areas they are reporting that they are not working in agriculture they are working in manufacturing or they are working even in services sector even in rural areas right whether it's hospitality or whether it's education health etc so there is there is a small services sector also that's growing in the rural areas and men are part of that you know shift that structural shift what we call in economics right but women are not part of that structural shift women have remained in agriculture now agriculture is and is a sector which has been the backbone of uh, you know the indian economy and still continues to employ more than half the population but it also occupies it also employs 75 percent of rural women even today you know and it's actually increased during covid so my point is that this all weather sector which is actually not growing or creating that many jobs is the only one where women can go and work then obviously women will start you know moving out of the labor force when they don't have opportunities and when household income is sufficient because they are always the secondary income earners. So, you know, when you combine all of these effects together, you start to see a situation where rural women are just, you know, not working. And also then you, of course, have the expectations of unpaid work, which become harder and harder over the years, because the kind of activities that rural women have to do when it comes to unpaid work, like water collection, for example, and, and the kind of cooking and cleaning and, you know, child care and the expectations of elderly care, which are also coming on to, uh, you know, rural women more and more. Uh, you know, if you have fewer number of children in the family, even in rural areas, but you have the same number of elderly person, uh, you know, persons who have to be taken care of, then the amount of time a woman has to spend on elderly care also increases. Because men are not doing any of this. Like I can tell you from the data, men are doing two minutes of elderly care a day. So, um, you know, in such a scenario, when you combine all these effects together, you start to see women just leaving the labor force altogether. Super fascinating. And I, I, I totally, uh, you know, I'm able to relate even from all my experiences to what you're saying. I mean, and the three part par problem of this, right? One part of the problem, as you rightly said, is as long as we look at women's labor uh, participation as a secondary priority to male's labor participation, I think there are norms that are set and internalized by everyone in the society saying this is, I mean, the woman is going to go to work if we really need it in some form. And the second is even if women agree to then go to work, the availability of market opportunities are dismal. And it's almost always agriculture. And I, I, you know, just to share a personal anecdote here, we wanted to pilot at Sattva a model where we wanted to create a micro, small manufacturing unit for apparel in rural Uttar Pradesh. And one of our first questions we had was, you know, who will come? Because the money is not a lot. It's, you know, for 300, 400 rupees. And the first day we actually had a lot of women and almost all of them were graduates. Because the idea of sitting inside a building uh, you know, being treated right, which is to come in the certain time in the morning and go at the certain time in the evening, and to do something that involves skill, was something that so many graduate women in rural UP were waiting for. You know, because going back, it's far cry from going to the fields and doing labor work. And I think there is just this 
uh, you know latent workforce that is there which is waiting for opportunities that can actually be made available to them and if an apparel unit that pays them really you know and we were starting up at that point on point in time so the income wasn't great but they said even that's fine you know we would actually come and do something meaningful which we think is a skilled role rather than stay at home Uh, I wanted to sort of build on what you've said here and another point that you made around how women's work is concentrated to certain sectors. Textile is one that we made as an example as well. But Mithali, I want to run by you something that we had discussed in an earlier podcast episode. There seems to be, uh, you know, norms change around what society considers a good sector for women to work. For example, it's okay for girls in Orissa to travel all the way to Bangalore to get jobs in apparel, you know. Uh, as long as they are going in a group, as long as uh, they're doing that job, it seems like the social norms have accepted it, you know. And changing social norms around women labor force participation seems like it does industry by industry. Uh, and one you mentioned is the network effect, which is that I don't have networks in other industries, so I have a limitation. But do you think there is also truth in, uh, you know, assuming that there is a certain acceptance of women being in certain sectors? And I've heard this also in the United States where most nurses were men at some point in time and now it's all women. There's a growing social acceptability of seeing uh, women as nurses, etc. Is that uh, in play here as well when you see women concentration in certain industries? So, um, you know, Ratish, I think the story in India is a little bit different. And, and this is exactly why, you know, we have to make some distinctions between the different uh, states, regional contexts, and, and also between ages, you know, because, because youth and, and what the youth wants today and different, you know, age groups within the youth as well, the aspirations are very different and the realities are very different. So, um, you know, like, for example, you talked about the Odisha example, right, that they don't have a problem with the girls going, working as long as they are in a group. But my question to you would be, how many of those girls were married? Mm. You know, because the marital status, again, same, same issue in the UP example you talked about. Right. So, you know, uh, as part of my work with a number of international organizations, I've been going and working in UP for almost three years. Recently, I started a new project in Madhya Pradesh. And we are seeing the same story repeat again and again, where, you know, young women have this vision of themselves and of their lives, where they imagine and envision themselves working. And they do it for maybe one or two years. In fact, they are trying, you know, even um, like in the face of all of these challenges. But then they start you know, falling out of the labor force in rural areas after marriage. Marriage is the first hurdle. In urban areas, the women who are working, at least after marriage, the numbers, you know, there used to be a cliff effect of marriage, uh, which, which Ashley McKinsey had also noted in a global study and, and then, you know, even in an Indian study. And, and we found that, you know, that cliff effect is starting to come down. At Nikora Associates, we are doing that research and we're working with a number of corporates and they are telling us through their data, internal tracking, that look, the cliff effect after marriage is coming down. But in urban areas, the cliff effect after children, the first child, is not coming down, right? And in rural areas, the cliff effect happens after marriage. So, while we may change norms around, um, you know, for young girls, and, and why are parents doing that? It's because they also want to give their daughters a little bit of freedom at the beginning of their lives. You know, okay, go, go work for one year, two years, but you have to be married. Is the mindset that continues even today. And then the second aspect I want to highlight is the gap between the aspirations and again vision of life that young women have and young men have you know because while we're having all of these conversations about balancing work and and child care etc with women those conversations are not happening with men and men continue to be told and and you know social norms reinforced 
around how you know they will have an unfettered existence even after they get married um and they will continue to live at their parental homes and they will continue to go to work and basically the change that you know happens for a woman in her life continues to be there in urban areas as well as rural areas regardless of what age you're getting married at you know which doesn't happen for men so men are not being told by their parents and especially by their mothers that they have to partake in unpaid work or they have to so even today if if i have to move from my job to say you know to another city i cannot expect my husband to move but if he moves maybe he will expect me to move i'm not saying it from a personal point of view i'm saying it as a representative urban woman right and these are the kind of issues that urban couples are having you don't see that happening in rural areas because you don't see that problem yet because not that many women are working um you know in those in those groups as i said the women in rural areas are choosing to work in agricultural labor wage labor because that agricultural field is probably attached to their homes or very close to their homes right and because they are that's a supplementary income again the ones who are working are working for the money so um you know so so these aspects until these change until these inter intra household um, you know bargaining actually uh, improves the lot for women we i don't think that we can actually see this kind of uh, norm shift to that extent you know as you were talking i was thinking about all the factors you've laid out in your da you know in your argument around what all changes the uh, la- what all influences labor workforce participation for women you know we started talking about rural and urban being two different uh, you know sort of factors uh, saying you know if you're rural versus if you're urban we also talked about um, education levels uh, you know how if you're a post graduate versus if you're a school dropout etc we've now talked about marital status um, you know uh, and them having children or not having children are there other aspects that you think have a material impact on labor workforce participation apart from uh, you know is whether they are in rural or urban their educational qualification their marital status whether they have children what are what are the other factors that actually deeply impact and you know have either a cliff effect or just a strong correlation to labor workforce participation for women i think one thing we haven't spoken about today is skill training and uh, you know i i really want to emphasize skill training because for such a long time we had the pm kaushal vikas yojana and it was a very successful scheme in the sense that it actually introduced a new culture and respect for skill training in the country and you know i've been working on industrial corridor development um with a number of the agencies uh that are coming up with government of india and industrial corridors and manufacturing sector and the entire make in india campaign atmanirbhar bharat campaign production linked incentives you know this is where the growth push is and this is where the employment generation push is and there is such huge skill gaps in the manufacturing sector you know you you have newer and newer uh technologies coming into manufacturing automation coming into the manufacturing sector which actually make it easier for skilled persons whether it's men or women uh, to join the sector because you know those original ideas of manufacturing as a sector where you needed a lot of brute force to actually work in the sector or physical strength to work in the sector don't actually exist today you know you you just actually have a situation where if you know how to operate some of the machinery and equipment as a woman you can do a lot of it and the shift system actually works very well for women because women are the kind of people who want a little more flexibility in their work right so they are more keen on flexibility so they are happy to go to a factory and work as long as they are again given that respect as you saw in in the case of up and also a shift where they have clear timings that okay at this time you come at this time you leave so you know whether it's garments to or whether it's manufacturing smartphones i don't see any reason why women can't do it but they are not doing it right now and the main reason is the lack of skill training so if we actually start bringing more and more women 
into skill training which are considered non traditional sectors you know so if you look at the pm kvy data most of the women trainees actually opted for skill training in beauty services that was the number one choice because of course it's a very uh, you know lucrative industry the salon industry and 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 it's a huge part of the women economy the she economics um you know that we talk about but we really need more women carpenters more women plumbers more women electricians um you know and and the skill training can actually provide these women with these opportunities but they are not opting for it and and even when we look at skill training for advanced manufacturing is something where i would like to see a lot more women and at this point you don't see them so until there's a kind of a incentive mechanism where you know even from government side we say okay uh, if you are by the way taking women in an area where they are where they are underrepresented then we can you know give you a higher incentive or you can even have quotas and say that no you must hit a target as a you know skill training provider and bring in at least 30% women into your um, you know class on uh, automotive engineering you know for example so i think there's a need to push uh women's skill training in non traditional sectors because at this point they have been excluded from this and this is where the jobs are going to be you know in industrial corridor development and manufacturing in in you know in these emerging technology oriented uh, manufacturing where india wants to be a big player you know uh, in the next decade and then the second aspect related to that is definitely the digital divide right because if if women want to operate small businesses from home or they want to do hybrid work or they want to uh, you know work uh, from home or work flexibly even in the services sector going forward then they need to be technologically literate and in fact competent and very very comfortable in using any kind of technology and adapting to new technologies and and the digital divide you know it's it's got several layers it's not just about being digitally literate it's about being very comfortable and you know knowing how to optimize the use of technology so i think women really need to that's where i feel like women really need to be pushed and said no you must upskill yourself and and on the other side i ref- definitely think that there should be incentives for skill training providers to bring women into non traditional sectors I mean, I have so many questions to ask you. Uh, from based on what you said, Sandra, I'm going to structure myself better. Um, and let's pick up. I think there are four parts. There is the question around norms that I wanted to ask you, uh, and see how we sort of uh, you know look at changing it. What 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 does change norms? And the second is really the uh, the beauty salon uh, point that you made, and how you know beautician training, and I know the tailoring uh, also has a very similar sort of response in the skill training ecosystem. And how do you sort of shift it? And you know who's incentive is there to make this happen and it's also the third point i wanted to talk about um, skill training uh, because i've had a chance to work on that space and i've seen that there are you know looking at it from a supply side versus looking at it from a demand side challenge that's consistently remained uh, in skill training and then finally the point that you made around how do we create the right sort of pathways overall uh, at scale uh, the point to the point that i mentioned earlier Uh, around married versus non married staff and i wanted to come back to the indicator question a little bit there as well but let's talk about norms uh, you know um, in in your experience is there any data that we already have that captures social norms and social uh, you know beliefs uh, in an effective way and does that help us understand how it's changing over the years or how it hasn't changed over the years at all i'm curious to anchor this discussion on norms on data uh uh mithali and i i'd love to know if you've had uh, you know data sets or experience that tell you that okay this is how we're seeing it both among men and women and i wanted to also get your thoughts if any on the idea of what will change norms you know i uh, i have some thoughts on it but i'd love to hear your views on how do we change it because it's so fundamental to the problem that we are solving no absolutely so i think when it comes to norms what are the data sources definitely i have been using nfhs um and you know the questions that we talked about around agency women's participation and household decision making mobility and and then of course also this new data set on unpaid work 
all of these are reflective of social norms, isn't it? That if women are doing 29 times the amount of work as men on cooking, or if they are doing three times the amount of work as men on childcare, then clearly those are norms, you know, those are reflections of social norms. And if we look at, for example, um, you know, some of the NFHS data, which is dating back to NFHS one to five, we have five rounds. Um, that gives us a good good sense of how things have progressed. But just looking at you know some of the most recent data, like uh, from NFHS four in 2015, 16 to now in 19, 20, 21, we can actually see hardly any change in things like um, you know mobility and and independence of mobility. Where uh, in 15, 16, 40 percent of women were allowed to go to say the market alone, but today it's just 42.3. So, you know, that's hardly a change. That's a very small change. On the other hand, you have, uh, you know, how many women actually have bank accounts? And in 15, 16, that was 53%. Today, that's 78.6%. So what's the real difference between the two things? The difference between the two, you know, norms around women's uh, mobility versus having an independent bank account is the presence of the Jandhan Yojana. The fact that you had a Jandhan Yojana to say that, you know, women should have bank accounts and that all of these, you know, government benefits and schemes will come directly into the woman's bank account through, uh, you know, either cash transfer or will require women's bank account, Jandhan bank account for giving, making them eligible for some of these schemes meant that women went and created those bank accounts, right? So there was a clear incentive mechanism in place for a shift in those norms. Right. So now it, it tells you what works, what works in the end when you are trying to shift norms is an economic incentive. So if tomorrow you created an economic incentive for women's mobility, women's independent mobility, that yes, when she is mobile, she will be able to earn more, you know, or she will be able to bring more benefits to the family, then, you know, you will actually start to see the norms around mobility start to shift or and in the case of mobility, of course, you have to also make the mo mobility uh, options safer. Because right now, one of the biggest sort of challenges to, to independent mobility of women is the fact that you have a fear of harassment and a very genuine fear of uh, sexual harassment in public transport and in public spaces. Vitaly, you've emphasized also how skilling is important. And, you know, I've been working in this space for a while. I, I, I always am ambivalent about skill development for many reasons. You know, it's always, it's, it's largely been a supply-led exercise, uh, which is to really skill a lot of people. There is really very limited market pull for skilled people. Uh, there is really no premium for skilled, uh, you know, staff as opposed to unskilled staff, at least somebody who's gone to a skilling program. There has been also the challenge of creating s ways in which skilled people can have some incentive to get and land at better roles. Though there is this argument around career progression because of skilling, there is really no substantive data that's proven that to be true. So when we say that we need uh, women to be skilled for so that we move them to jobs, I wonder if skilling is the biggest lever uh, to be able to make that shift happen. Because as you rightly said, when offered skill training, they move to traditional uh, roles or traditional industries where they feel it's women friendly, going back to a point around textile apparel, etc. as well. So one way of uh, looking at this is to say skilling opens their mind, their perspectives uh, around being able to be part of this industry and that supply sort of comes in. Uh, but another way to look at it is, and this is something you touched upon earlier, are there incentives for companies to create an increased number of women in their manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, plants, and then build the required environment for the women to actually work there, and that's spurring the supply side, be it skill programs, employment generation programs, and all of that. Because in the absence of a demand, and in the absence of obvious, uh, you know, um, in some motivations on the supply side at scale, I wonder whether skill training will be the strongest lever for us to sort of shift this trend that you're talking about. I hear you. And, and of course, uh, that's absolutely logical, you know, because uh, the data has also borne it out in the Indian context that skill training alone does not work. But then, you know, we are in a chicken and egg situation, essentially. 
when we are at a factory floor definitely there is a demand for labor right and more and more especially the larger companies are not worried about the gender of their workforce you know they are happy to go and make investments in setting up uh, you know women's wings at at factories i have spoken to a number of fmcg companies and and food processing companies where women actually have uh, you know uh, very uh, deep skills especially in in food processing where you know they know about new i mean uh, traditional recipes etc which are becoming the you know name of the game for the growth of food processing companies and they are very keen to hire women uh, for manufacturing of many of these products and scaling it up and they are happy to invest in in facilities so there is an interest that's coming from companies on ground as we speak with them that you know we want to have more and more women and one of the major factors for this is also one is of course the inherent skills and and what you um, you know traditionally possess but the second is also with respect to unionizing because there's a clear uh, sort of message that's coming out to the manufacturing sector that women don't unionize as much as men do at least at this point they are not doing it so you know in order to actually i mean it's not a great incentive but in order to reduce the amount of strikes and uh, you know uh, labor union unionization there is a interest in hiring more and more women and having more and more diversity even on the shop floor so you know in such a scenario when this is the headwind when it comes to employers if they don't have a ready set of talent available to hire then then they will also be you know in a in a mode where they give up on on trying to hire more and more women when it comes to the mode of skill delivery right the the problem in india is much more about how do we skill right what is the mechanism that we use to deliver skill training and that you know of course needs a reimagining but in that in that time you know in that time while we figure many of these solutions out and those innovative models start coming in such as for example is being done in kaziabad or uh, you know where you actually have a tinkering lab that's being set up uh, for you know the manufacturing sector in in partnership with the industry association of that area in the engineering space you can have uh, you know government schemes which actually incentivize apprenticeships much more at this time you do have an apprenticeship scheme by the government of india but very few companies are actually availing it because of the fact that it's a limited um you know limited fund and limited size uh, of apprenticeships are available so we can always reimagine apprenticeships and and really scale that up and make it much more gender friendly you know gender equality friendly and say that you know we are going to give you a a greater incentive if you hire women apprentices as opposed to men and that's a great way of saying that we want to have more and more women participating in the labor force and here's a small incentive for for employers to come in train women on the job and and that you know the cost of that is borne partially by the government so there is a lot that can be done with just a public incentive scheme where the delivery of skill training is not in the traditional sense you know and then it puts a incentive on the employer to find women uh, to avail the scheme so there are yeah. ways of uh, you know working around it but it can't no, work alone i think the point that resonates with me is to sort of find incentives that people have towards hiring more women in the workforce which is more a, a way to a uh, further demand than increase supply and i i i always feel that the market or the supply side will respond to where there is the right in f- financial incentive you know if we let know that uh, women have jobs where they can come on time there is a bus that picks them up and they get pays them uh, sort of 15000 rupees a month there is going to be an automatic supply that's going to get created so finding ways to uh, look at incentives for companies to create those schemes models and just a capacity percentage that they have to hit of women in the workforce i think is important and i mean the other uh, aspect that i know is being tried in other areas is also just signaling at the leadership level which is not only making a financial or an economic argument which i think is important but also make the moral argument in this to say are you signaling as an equal opportunity employer today because a lot of these companies that are running manufacturing plants are also now conglomerates you know uh, and hence their group level signaling actually translates down to manufacturing plants and if you look at the birlas adanis tatas etc these are large conglomerates that actually 
orchestrate a significant part of our value chain not just companies so which means if they establish norms in their respective plants and then scale it down to their supply chain that signaling as a value i think will also have a significant impact as well and i think once some of this happens the supply sort of organizes itself is my feeling uh, because the challenge as you rightly highlighted when you spoke is that with skilling the model issue is still a question we may not be preparing them for industry and the industry acknowledge the preparation that we are making as well right from traditional iti's to short term skilling programs the other aspect i want to build on from this uh, leadership uh, signaling is uh, the fact that it's not just whether the women have skills it's also whether the infrastructure in these locations are sufficient enough for women to work you know um, i remember this uh, time a, a colleague of mine and i went to a cement plant in coimbatore she couldn't find a ladies toilet in the entire facility you know she finally had to use a gents toilet so this dichotomy uh, you know saying that yes we want more women and then is assuming that we are sort of invisible uh, around the infrastructure we need for women to actually effectively work uh, in a corporate environment i'm guessing is also a challenge but i'd love to hear your thoughts on that no absolutely uh, you know ritesh i think uh, this entire question of infrastructure and what is the infrastructure that is going to facilitate women's uh, workforce participation is a very very important one so the first is basic as you said you know toilets are just the basic facility and in fact there's a friend of mine devina sen gupta who works with the live mint and she actually did a full journalistic uh, you know investigation and she found that even in urban areas you have a large proportion of offices which share the women's toilet amongst each other you know so if they are in a building there will be one floor which will have a women's toilet just you know maybe the top floor or the bottom floor or something and that will be like a common women's toilet and there will be a men's toilet on every floor and this is a very common phenomenon in delhi so you can imagine how you know things are in other uh, you know maybe smaller locations at factories i can definitely tell you and share with you that it has happened with me as well that i have not been able to find um, you know a ladies toilet when i've gone uh, for factory visits and to industrial areas it's a huge huge lacuna and this is despite the fact that we've had you know the swachh bharat mission and we've had such a huge focus on constructing toilets and especially focusing on women's sanitation so i think the the first lever when it comes to infrastructure is sanitation infrastructure toilets availability of menstrual product, products in the toilets uh, you know uh cleaning the toilet on time so it's not only constructing the toilet but also operation and maintenance of that facility which is always worse in women's toilets as compared to men's toilets regardless of whether one is going to um you know a top notch commercial uh, mall or establishment where an office may be based in an urban area or in rural areas so i think this is the first one the second one is around crash facilities and i'm highlighting crash and not saying just care facilities because women are doing three times the amount of child care work as men this is evident in the you know tus data every day on average women are spending 30 minutes on child care and i mean of course this is much much more in the case of uh, you know women who are not in the labor force or who are you know nursing young children etc so they're spending a large pro- proportion of their life on child care especially you know care of infants which is much more intense and and also young uh, you know young children and for that you need to have child care facilities within your you know working establishment they cannot you can't just leave your child at the mercy of you know some uh, third party facility you need to be very very sure that you trust the person uh you know the service provider where you leave your child and this is extremely important for urban women i mean even narega actually advocates for crash facilities to be there at construction sites but i have never seen it and you know i'm sure it's there in some of them i'm i'm only speaking and i totally but we need to have a clear data collection to say how many narega sites in india today actually have the crashes that are mandatory you know and acknowledge that maybe they are not there and that and and women are actually working so much more and participating so much more in narega activities and yet they don't have access to creches which means women who are nursing children or have younger children are probably not able to even take up narega work right so 
so we need to have a big push towards having crashes let's first you know establish the toilets establish the crashes these are two very important things and then the third is around safe mobility and transport to and from the workplace so you know as you said they need to have a bus to take them to the you know factory site and back but that's an additional cost right at the end of the day if you had safe walking cycling and public transport infrastructure to take women from their homes to the factory and bring them back then the factory wouldn't need to arrange a bus service for them so at the end of the day we need more and more investment in public transport and that doesn't mean having just ladies compartments it means ensuring that you know there is actually a grievance redressal mechanism to report a complaint of sexual harassment if somebody does that it means that there are you know clear messages that are posted all over a metro or a bus or a um, you know any other mode of transport that we have to say that sexual harassment is a zero tolerance offense and and you know it goes against the social norms of that city or that village or that area where you know somebody is traveling and i'm i'm curious uh, uh, mithali as you're speaking is there already data that tells us the extent of gaps in infrastructure today be it in workplaces like you mentioned narega i'm guessing we can extend that to other sort of facilities as well uh, data around mobility and so on uh, is there available data today that can actually drive uh, uh, an informed conversation on these topics not at all in fact uh, ratish and i think these are really large data gaps for us to fill uh, especially around infrastructure because you know we don't have a uh, systematic data collection of infrastructure at private establishments at you know government construction sites and and you know even if you had that kind of reporting it would only be on new projects maybe on the dashboard so say for example swachh bharat was tracking in such a you know methodical way uh, they had a proper dashboard to look at how many toilets were being built in each ward and you know just even below the block level you know in, in every village ward so you could actually with a gps map look at how uh, and where a new toilet was coming up but you don't have that for the narega crash facilities right so i think definitely these are the areas where we need to collect more data and you know we are still waiting for the new census to be done so mobility data was collected regularly in the census but it's not being uh, collected at this point as the census is delayed So I want to sort of move to a more solution lens. I think we've talked about the problems, and uh, you know, throughout the conversation, you've been highlighting areas that we need to focus on. I'd love to hear from you if you were to be making the decisions on improving women labor workforce participation today, and we're asked to come up with three high priority solutions that you think will shift the needle. And I know this is a systemic issue, and point solutions don't help. But I'd love to still hear from you. What would you prioritize? as core focus areas to work on based on based on all the data and analysis you've seen i think the first thing i think about is partnerships as i said you know there are two big groups of women that are currently in work right we have the women in the corporate sector and and in you know the post graduate women in the urban areas and the second is you know the women who are in agriculture and agricultural wage laborers so the first thing i would do is really have more and more partnerships with the private sector to try and see how we can expand employment to a larger number of groups of women whether it's through skill training whether it's through supporting women entrepreneurship and whether it's through you know a self employment and and providing women with more education so at the end of the day i would work with private sector employers to first create a you know demand for women's labor the second aspect i would like to look at is definitely around preferential procurement which the government can do for women led enterprises so if you look at the preferential procurement norms today there's a reservation of around 3% preferential procurement from women led msmes 
And I would probably say that, you know, let's raise that to 10% or 15% or 20%. Why can't we procure more as a government from women-led enterprises? And, you know, try to give more and more contracts and work to women-led enterprises. That will create, a, you know, steady demand for products from women-led MSMEs. And I think the third aspect that I would immediately start thinking about is how can we hire more and more women in PWDs, you know, urban public works and, and rural public works and on the roles of, uh, you know, government-led infrastructure projects so that you can immediately start having women coming in and working in a regularized environment with a salaried job, even if they are doing semi-skilled work. So I think this is this is a way for bridging and, you know, trying to get those groups in of women into the workforce, which are currently absolutely not represented at all. So these are very short term solutions I'm talking about, you know, those three immediate things that you would do. And then, of course, in the long term, as we've talked about, you know, in the long to medium term, providing support to women led MSMEs through access to finance, access to markets, access to digitized di digital solutions and technology, uh, you know, sort of mainstreaming digitization and, and digital curriculums in schools, having more and more skill training in partnerships with uh, employers. So, you know, these are all aspects which one can look at from a you know medium term lens. And then, of course, from the long term lens, the data collection aspects we spoke about, but also building infrastructure, which is gender sensitive, you know, whether it's built public spaces in our cities or whether it's public transport, or whether it's energy infrastructure, toilets, anything around city design, which can facilitate the entry of women. And the last thing is really around investing in care services and care infrastructure. So one is the crashes point, which I mentioned at, you know, at employer premises. But apart from that, India really needs to scale up its investments into the care economy. Right now, it's just 1% of the GDP. But looking at, you know, regularizing the work of Anganwadi workers and, you know, ASHA workers who are all care workers and trying to recognize them as workers, giving them wages and, and really improving the care infrastructure in rural and urban areas is very, very important. The last part I wanted to touch upon with the with, with, with just came up in the conversation today, Mithali, and is is the whole idea of digital. You know, I think it is by far the most promising area where uh, a lot of the structural challenges in terms of location, distance, mobility can be addressed if we create a vibrant economy for women in digital. And through the conversation today, we've been talking about some of the things that can be done to enable it. One, I think you touched upon right in the beginning, just far more nuanced data on digital and women. It will be extremely valuable uh, for us to understand usage, level of usage, what they do, how they, you know, how is it rationed in any way and what are bar bar barriers, etc. Uh, we've touched upon skill training and digital awareness and literacy around, uh, you know, how do we promote that at scale as a way to solve this as well. Are there other clear uh, ideas that you have, anything that your data informs you that we can use to be able to move that? Because that can be a significant lever in improving labor workforce participation. Hmm. No, absolutely. Um, you know, Ritesh, we can do that. But I think the bigger problem with digital is that at this point, we are grappling with even the basics, you know, what we can do. I mean, imagine a scenario where you have a woman entrepreneur who is, uh, you know, based in a tier two or tier three town. She is well versed with using digital payments, you know, so she has her entire digital payment architecture set up so that she can sell anywhere, uh, you know, in India at least or at least even, even abroad. Then she has, you know, a digital inventory management system. So she optimizes her costs when it comes to, uh, you know, inventory management and accounting. For example, she has a, you know, nice tally or, or even more uh, advanced accounting software that she and her team are using. And then she also has, uh, you know, great presence on Amazon or Flipkart. And, uh, you know, she has a great digital marketing team, which, uh, which does her optimal social media and uh, and lo and behold, she also has her website. 
you know so what i've just described here is a very very ideal scenario which i have also not hit at nikor associates you know i am also struggling with my social media and my website and um you know what have you and how to manage uh, uh, my team digitally so imagine this is the optimal level right digital payments digital marketing digital inventory management digital accounting and digital linkages and and social media is what you need to run a digitally functional enterprise as a person and if a woman is able to do that she can really unlock so many efficiencies right and women's presence in in these marketplaces and digital marketplaces and digital payments uh, and and designing fintech solutions is just so low so if you don't have women designing those solutions then you're automatically going to create a gender bias from the word go and and then as we said you know hardly any digital natives so i think there's a huge opportunity here for involving more and more women in designing solutions in the digital marketplaces in the digital payments industry in the digital marketing industries and in fintech and bringing women into these industries so that you can actually upscale and create more and more especially women entrepreneurs who use these digital solutions and and you're right that there is there is this inherent blindness in a lot of what we do when it comes to gender which we don't even recognize uh you know a colleague of mine recently was talking to me about the size of the phones and said almost every phone is today sized for the man's hand uh you know and uh, how does that impact usage and hence how does it impact dexterity and so on and i think a lot of times when i'm in conversations like this i'm just hit by just the blindness that all of us carry and as you rightly said and i think even when you talked about the pwd i felt part of the uh, value is immediate and short term which is they get jobs but part of it is just the fact that public works department have a feminine you know a lens to uh, some of the problems that we are solving that helps us think about this problem more holistically and having women at all levels just helps us and forces us to keep that lens to the problems that we solve and it's very very true uh, uh, mithali i know we've we've spoken for a lot uh, and we've covered a fair distance in terms of both the issues and solutions i just wanted to have a question that i often end with uh, which is where can philanthropy play a role in this entire conversation because i always believe there are things that philanthropy can do and it cannot and there are things that it shouldn't be doing uh, which actually can create perverse incentives and i think through through the conversation today you've highlighted some but i wanted to know if you had any initial thoughts on what can philanthropy in some sense do to be able to accelerate the progress that we can create around labor workforce participation of women hmm so i think the first thing that they can do is start measuring how much they are already doing you know and i think when we talked about data the ministry of uh, commerce and industry and also corporate affairs are both now coming out with data on on you know where philanthropy is contributing how much is being uh, spent and what all it's being spent on so i think we need a lot more transparency when it comes to philanthropy overall on how much they are uh doing for for you know gender equality and and of course they may want to do it for groups other than women so but i won't comment on that because that's not the subject for today but you know really trying to see play, how much they are able to place a gender lens on their existing portfolio of investments will help them also track that you know how much of their investment in in social projects is gender sensitive so i think that's sort of step one of of where they can begin but the second aspect is really looking at the gendered impacts of their projects you know because sometimes what happens is there are inadvertent adverse impacts of uh projects which are not seen at the start so it can really help to do a gendered impact analysis and if, an assessment and to see you know what will happen if i finance this project will it actually help women how much will it help women and how much could and could it create you know uh, chasms in society or could it have an adverse impact on gender relations at all so i think that's really an approach thing which you know which which really should become standard and these things should be done in government as well but at least philanthropists can um you know do it because their investments are of course smaller than government in investments and you know more focused and micro at that stage and therefore it becomes easier to do this kind of analysis 
And the third aspect really is around what kind of projects they are supporting and can they bring a gender lens in that project. So if you're doing an education project, can you somewhere say that, you know, we will provide some incentives for or some scholarships for girl students? You know, you're building a school, but can you also make sure that you're providing incentives for girl students? And you're building a school, can you make sure that, the, you know, the girls' uh, washrooms are actually uh, maintained, not only built, I'm sure they're building them, but, you know, also look at the maintenance of it. And then what are you doing for the teachers who are coming to your schools? Because that's actually women, right? So are you building a crash in your school for the teachers who are coming and teaching there? So, you know, have that kind of a holistic sense, even in their existing projects. Apart from that, can they, you know, support innovative projects around gender? I mean, you know, because that's really where we can experiment, isn't it? With government financing, it's taxpayers' money. We may not have the room to experiment and innovate. But with, with philanthropic projects, can they go in and experiment? I think Rohini Nilikani and Nilikani um, Foundation has done such a great job with engaging men and boys being their, you know, main sort of messaging around gender equality and they've come out with you know whether it comes to publications or projects around engaging men and boys when it comes to schools and really you know intervening there and and working with boys in schools on on their attitude towards girls so they are trying something which is you know in the education space itself but it is something very innovative similarly we can have so many more innovative projects around gender at school level, at college level, for skill training, you know, which 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 can be really supported by the philanthropic sector. So I think keeping that, you know, eye open for innovation is something that I would really expect from a philanthropic foundation as opposed to, you know, a government. Absolutely. And uh, the good news is, Mithali, a lot of this is starting today. You know, the, the gender lens to some of the issues we are solving across education, agriculture, health, etc., it's a lot more uh, prominent today than even a few years ago. And the appetite for innovation in philanthropy is growing. And there is much more interest in trying ideas that, that, that have a high chance of failure, we, even if it helps us learn what doesn't work. I think that that's becoming common as well. But it's good to reiterate some of these things again, because this is really where I truly believe uh, and agree with you that uh, philanthropy can add the most value. Mithali, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, it's always a joy to talk to people who've looked at subjects very deeply, understood the nuances of it, uh, and are able to bring an informed view on you know areas where we might have a broader sense of the challenge, but not as specific and nuanced as uh, one might need to. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, you know, it was so different from having a standard, uh, you know, shouting match on a television uh, debate. <laughs> <laughs> Here we could actually debate the ideas rather than, uh, you know, the ideologies. So thank you so much for that. You have been listening to Decoding Impact. To learn more about Sattva and Sattva Knowledge Institute, please explore sattva.co.in. We invite you to like, share and subscribe to Decoding Impact so you never miss out on new episodes. Thank you for joining us.